Well, thank you so much for coming on, Dr. Brendan Egan. Yeah, good reader. In our emails back and forth, we uh, had a little uh, a dialogue about sort of where you're bullish on ketones and where you're not, and your um, it, 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 it's more complicated than just being blanket. Ketones are this be all and end all that's going to cure everyone's problems all the time, which I think yeah. um, these things get overhyped. So I think today it'd be interesting to dive into um, where there's prom- promising applications for exogenous yeah. ketones, where there's not, and I think a good place to start is just what's the difference between a natural state of ketosis um and exogenous ketones i think that's a good place to start right so um the natural state of ketosis for most people uh is if they haven't eaten for eight ten twelve hours you know when you wake up in the morning after an overnight fast uh naturally the body will have produced a little bit more ketones overnight than would typically happen say after a meal for example so that early morning state is usually a state of ketosis and if you extend the fast out to 12 16 24 hours that's when ketone concentrations in, in the bloodstream are, are very obvious. Um, so that's the natural state. It's caused by, you know, the absence of food intake, or if we talk about a ketogenic diet, that would be consuming, you know, foods as, as normal uh, throughout the day. But because they're very low in carbohydrates, they will naturally induce a state of uh, ketosis by the fact that they amplify ketogenesis. So we're always uh, going back and forth between the terminology, ketogenesis, ketosis, ketone bodies, you know, so if I if I ever um you know send too many of these too much jargon just jump in and, and tell me, right. but um so that that'll be the natural state. Uh, effectively, it's a state of either the absence of food for you know for a period of eight to twelve hours or longer, or it's following a, a ketogenic diet. The exogenous ketosis. So again, this can be referred to in a lot of different terms. Some people say acute nutritional ketosis. Other people call it, call it intermittent exogenous ketosis. Again, a lot of a uh, lot of terminology here. Um, but that's where we consume a. a product um, and it can be in various forms which I think we'll probably talk about but it's some form of a supplement that we consume that increases our blood ketone body concentrations um, again what does that number need to be typically at, at we use at rest we talk about 0.1 millimolar so after yeah. a meal and then as we again get into you know fasting deeper fasting taking supplements it's going onwards up towards one two three uh, millimolar concentration. Okay. So the the ketone con- the ketone supplement or the exogenous ketosis that you mentioned there is effectively kind of getting above one millimolar after the ingestion of a, of a compound that, that increases blood ketone body concentrations. Okay, wonderful. So so for the listener who's sort of um, I guess reasonably new to this or maybe not so familiar, so yeah. where what we're talking about with the blood concentration is if you were to prick a finger and put your blood in a yeah. in a ketone. Um, I guess, blood measurement device, it's testing yeah. for a type of ketone called beta-hydroxybutyric. And yeah. to be, correct me if I'm wrong, if I'm over my skis here, but to be in a state of ketosis, it starts at 0.5 um, yeah. on, on the scale um, and then right. goes up and to different degrees depending on what you do. So maybe a good place to start is how high can you get that blood concentration of beta-hydroxybutyric with just standalone ketogenic diet and fasting alone and then maybe mm-hmm. if we could explore what there are what different uh, exogenous ketones the different types and how high yeah. they can sort of get you on the scale no i think that, that again these are these are good points to cover at the start because it does matter i think um the level to which bhb concentrations get uh, because the state of ketosis and uh, i think is an important consideration so if we were to look at, you know, the most extreme uh, example that you will see is the, the starvation experiments that were done, you know, basically more than 50 years ago. And they would have had people who were effectively starving uh, for up to 30, 40 days. And what you see is this progressive rise up into the kind of five, six millimolar range. Um, when we have an overnight fast, as you mentioned, you know, you kind of get into around that 0.3, 0.5 range. So notice that we're tenfold difference here in terms of concentration. Um, when we consume um, a lot of the different products that are out there, it can be anything from that 0.5 or 1 up to 3 or 4 millimolar, again, depending on, on the dose. Where it becomes limiting in some uh, respects is that um, the amount that you can consume as a single dose varies depending on the, the product that we use. So in theory, while we might be able to say, you know, you can go up towards 10 millimolar, that would require drinking or consuming a lot of one of the products to the extent that it probably really badly upset your stomach. So, um, you know, that's probably unlikely that people go that far. So 
Typically, what we see in the research studies, though, is that um, we're anywhere between one millimolar, three to four millimolar, depending on the application. On the lower end, there seems to be some benefits uh, in around the cognitive function domain. Um, for some of the upper values there, around three, film, three or four millimolar, that's typically done in sports performance um, domains. And again, I think we can um, get on to what, what the evidence is in each of those in terms of uh, performance effect. Yeah, absolutely wonderful. I think if anyone who hasn't tried a ketone supplement, I think it's fair to say a lot of them are very, um, and when I say ketone supplement, I mean exogenous ketones come in all yeah. sorts of different forms and they are often hit and miss sometimes yeah wonderful effects on the blood but you just can't do anything you're you're, you're either running to the final loo or you know it, it's not not safe to take in public often often so it, yeah, it's a very yeah. new field so i think the um the way i i tend to try and take it in, in different steps in terms of the type that are out there so we often talk about ketogenic precursors, and it sounds fancy, but these are the ones a lot of people are familiar with, which, which are things like uh, medium chain triglycerides. You know, the I know you had, had guests on before talking about MCTs. So these are effectively fats that are shorter, uh, short chain fats that are medium chain. I should say that's that's the definition that uh, they're promote they're um, uh, oxidized directly in the liver, and so they drive ketogenesis uh, in, in that regard. So effectively, you're consuming a fat, and you're getting the output from the liver being these these ketone bodies. Um, there's other, another molecule, which is a ketogenic precursor, which is called butane diol. Again, people will be familiar with this um, uh, product on the market. Something is called diol. Uh, Ketone IQ is an example of a product that's out there at the moment. There's a couple of other brands that have something similar. And this is like a, it's like a very similar to an alcohol, but it's also ketogenic. So consumption of that uh, will again produce ketone body concentrations as a result uh, coming from the liver. So that, that's an example of where you've got these molecules that are they're not ketone bodies, but they drive the ketogenic process in the liver. And as a result, you know, about an hour or so after, after ingestion, you get this rise in, in ketone body concentrations. Um, another class then is, is what we call ketone salts. And these are ketone bodies, usually this beta-hydroxybutyrate that you mentioned before, but they're delivered in a dose where effectively they're, they're bound to a salt. Um, so these can be sodium, potassium, calcium, and so on. And they are, um, Again, there's some, without getting too much into the, the biochemistry, there are kind of purer and impure forms of, of these. And I don't mean that from a, from a toxicity point of view. I mean that basically the, there's a form of beta hydroxybutyrate called R or D, uh, beta hydroxybutyrate. That's what we measure in the bloodstream. When we ingest some of these ketone salts, we're actually getting a mix of what are called R and S form. Now, again, it's into the weeds a bit here, but the reason that that's important is that sometimes you don't get this quite the same uh, change in blood BHB concentrations, as you might expect when you consume one of these ketone salts um, that are kind of this 50-50 split. So there's a lot of uh, innovation at the moment around trying to create ketone salts that have less salt for the reason that you mentioned earlier. It sends you run into the toilet if you, if you drink a lot of salt. Um, but then also this idea that if you can have a purer form of the, of the BHB component, that that would lead to greater uh, changes in blood BHB concentrations for a smaller amount of, of product being consumed. Um, so I would have said when we did some research, um, Jesus, five, six years ago now at this stage, um, back then these ketone salts were, they were the R and the S mixed and there was a lot of salt. And as a result, whenever you in, uh, ingested them, a lot of people had like gastrointestinal issues, diarrhea, didn't feel well in the stomach. But there's been quite a bit of innovation in that space at the moment. So I think those ketone salts are definitely becoming more, um, um, let's say more effective in terms of increasing BHB uh, for a smaller dose. Um, so that that's the the ketone salts, and they're they're widely available. They're they're uh, relatively cheap compared to what I'm going to talk about next, which is the so-called ketone esters. And ketone esters are effectively uh, the BHB molecule, and uh, that's bound to uh, another molecule. Let's say it can be anything, but it typically tends to be a uh, butane diol molecule. So uh, that that ketogenic precursor that I that I mentioned earlier, and the ester just just effectively means the two molecules are bound together. The bond is called ester bond. So when you consume um, a ketone ester, that bond is, is, is cleaved, it's broken uh, between the two molecules. The BHB constant, BHB molecule, kind of imagine, gets into the bloodstream quickly. The butane diol goes and does its thing. Uh, it's ketogenic in nature. And, uh, it's kind of like a double whammy, for want of a better word. So for the one molecule, you're getting kind of two effects in terms of a blood ketone concentration. So those molecules tend to be the ones that are most widely used in research because they have the least effect in terms of negative effect on, on the gastrointestinal tract, um, less upset tummy and so on. But they also give the greatest sort of change in, in ketone concentration 
within the bloodstream as well per, per molecule. But the big drawback compared to, so let's say, the ketone salts and the um, ketogenic precursors are that they're very expensive. Um, and I think that's probably where, if there's going to be innovation in the field, it might be something around ketone salts and their purity, or it might be around bringing down the price of, of uh, ketone esters. So for someone who hasn't taken an exogenous ketone before and they're thinking, okay, yeah. maybe they can play around with the, a simple blood monitor they have on, on Amazon or things like this. So what yeah. levels of BHB can we expect for, I guess, maybe the upper, the upper threshold of each exogenous and precursor um, ketone body. So what's the upper range for, say, like an MCT oil versus a salt versus a um, ester? Yeah, well, the, the thing here is that it really does depend on the dose. And um, in, in scientific papers, we often, we base the dosages typically based on a per kg body mass basis. So we will choose a certain number of grams or milligrams per kg of body mass. Um, so it's it's hard for me to give exact numbers, um, but let's just say that, you know, of the doses that are consumed, they kind of fall into a range, like I, like I kind of hinted at earlier, where how much can you take without causing any gastrointestinal upset? Um, so there's been a few of these type of, type, type of dose response um, studies. Oftentimes, we kind of use like the recommended dose on the, on the label if it's a commercial product, and we might do like that dose plus a dose above that. Um, but anyway, to, to cut a long story short, um, typically with the ketone salts, you're getting somewhere in the one millimolar range, um, whereas with the dose of the um, ketone esters, you're getting into the two, three, four millimolar range. Um, when we exercise, we actually oxidize a certain amount of, of um, ketone bodies. So typically, again, a resting value will be higher than an exercise value because we, you know, for want of a better word, burn them off. Um, so again, the, the, to, to, to your question about the, the ketogenic precursor, so something like a, a butane diol or, or a medium chain triglyceride, um, typically, again, that depends on the dose, as I said, but it's in the, in the 1 to 1.5, maybe 2 millimolar range, again, depending on how much is consumed. And what tends to happen, like there's certainly it's documented again in the scientific, scientific literature with MCT oils, people can get an upset tummy the first time they take it, maybe the second time, but with a bit of repeated exposure, people can tend to push up the, the gram value. So they might start off with only being able to consume 20 grams of oil, which would be, you know, two teaspoons or maybe a large tablespoon, for example. But after a couple of exposures, they can take that a little bit more. But again, there's a question of like, would you take 100 grams of MCT oil? No, because like, why would you drink that much oil? Uh, would be my answer. But um, at the same time, there are people who would be trying to get into deeper and deeper ketosis because they they, they find some benefits. Um, but you know, baked into that whole question there is what is the dose needed to have the effect? And it really does depend on what you mean by the effect. You know, mm. so in, in studies, for example, where they infuse ketone bodies in, into the blood and look at the metabolic response, you can see changes in in sort of brain ketone utilization in effects on, on liver, uh, sugar output um, as well. These are things that can occur at as little as 0.5, like relatively low uh, concentrations. Whereas in, in studies, at least in the exercise domain, the thinking is that it needs to be up in the 2 to 3 millimolar range in order for there to be a performance effect. But as we're probably talk about, there's, there's a lot of studies that show no performance effect. So mm. you know, the devil's in the detail, I suppose. As you said earlier, it's not going to work for everyone at all times. No, absolutely not. And I think it's important that the, I think extremes are never good and an extreme okay. blanket this is going to be your be all end all for alzheimer's cancer yeah. dementia type 2 diabetes your best exercise performance your best 5k time i mean i think it's just it's important to just um have a balanced um yeah. view on on this for whole sure. field as a whole and um i guess where would be a good place to go next is why did all the buzz and interest around exogenous ketones and exercise performance where did they even come from to start well the performance studies the the, the first one that was ever published um was in 2016 um, and that was a really comprehensive piece of work that came out of the um the lab um based at oxford university so tim clark well, professor tim clark was the, was the lead on that and that that group had been working on ketone esters for quite some time in the lead up to that they had uh, published some interesting data in a patent and there was a, a quite a bit of buzz in the background there was some rumors of British cycling um, were, were using the product and um, so that there was there was a kind of a there was a hype that was there uh, kind of in the in the public domain but then there was this really comprehensive piece of research that was published as well and again within that first paper there was five different studies and again various different characterizations of the metabolic response 
uh, the amount being oxidized during exercise, the effect on um, subst- uh, fuel utilization with the, within the muscle and so on. And then the capstone piece to that was a, was a performance trial that showed a 2% improvement in uh, cycling time trial performance in, in elite cyclists. And of course, you know, when you show, people say 2%, well, that doesn't sound like much. 2% to an elite cyclist is something huge. And um, that got obviously a, a lot of press. And um, again, predominantly, I think, embraced by professional cyclists in, in the first instance, people began to talk a lot about it. And then, of course, you know, whether it was a feature in the Daily Mail about, you know, the army are taking this or, you know, someone in cycling says these should be banned. Like those types of stories do get people's attention. They get people asking, what are these things? And, you know, maybe they are having a benefit. Um, but as, as it happened over the course of the next uh, five to six years, um, there's probably been about 30 uh, papers published uh, in, in, the, in the intervening time period that are focused on performance. And if I'm not mistaken, it's four papers out of that 30 or so that have actually shown a performance benefit. The vast majority have shown no effect, uh, and then a couple have shown null effect. So to, it's, it's one of those funny things. At the moment, there's definitely a, still a lot of talk about athletes using uh, ketones for performance. But in terms of what's there in the scientific literature, it's probably only very niche cases that, that they're beneficial to performance. And again, th- those use cases could be, you know, the one percenters in, in elite athletes. Um, but the point I always make is that it's a relatively expensive product to you know, potentially have an effect when there's a lot of other things that say, let's say non-elite athletes could be working on to try and improve their performance that isn't spending money on, on a ketone supplement in that way. Definitely, definitely. So what can we learn from those? Um, the What can we learn on the types of um, exercise? Because obviously there's various different types. Mm-hmm. Sprinting is different to bodybuilding, yeah. different to powerlifting, different to yeah. endurance. So if there is an exercise application, what has the most promising realm for um benefit i guess yeah i think the um it's tricky sometimes to say because there was a period of time where uh studies that have shown negative effects were all high intensity short duration and we were kind of settled you know a lot of us are saying that the time definitely not to use ketones is during a short duration high intensity effort and then all of a sudden a paper last year showed that there was a benefit on a on a like a seven minute time trial type of of uh, scenario so you know, sometimes you get you're you're trying to make uh, recommendations, but you're confounding yourself and saying "bosh" and "bosh," "bosh" uh, every time. Um, "Bosh," I'll say "bosh" again. The um, where where we think there might be some value is in the kind of um, like lower to moderate intensity, long duration stuff. So basically, like you know, marathon running and above, ultra endurance type scenarios. Um, our sort of feeling at the moment is that ketones are having an effect when the body is under um, quite a bit of stress. You know, it's almost like, um, I wouldn't say papering over the cracks, but, it's, you know, it's filling in the gaps when the body is, is in a particularly stressed state. So the evidence for that, I think, is, you know, there's a decent amount of work now coming out in hypoxia. So, you know, right. exercise or, or resting conditions in, in hypoxia, there seems to be effects. Um, where there's been cognitive effects, benefits shown in, in exercise, it's been in long duration um, activities. So like an ultra endurance uh, race or, some of the work that we showed was in a in a like a ninety minute protocol that mimicked soccer, but it was you know there's a cognitive load of changing direction, running back and forth, listening to the beeps. You know, it's, just, it's yeah. demanding in that way. So there's a, there's scenarios like that where there is some you know there seems to be some benefit, but like I said, there's there's a good you know nice number of papers that showed no effect. So I think I think that's where uh, it kind of comes back to this idea. You know, we asked the question why are why are so many um, athletes you know, reportedly using these ketone supplements if so much of the literature is showing that they don't have any performance effects. And I think what's going on there is that potentially there are some individuals who do show a response that's positive. Um, but I think the other thing that's being conflated is that the um, the p- most positive effects that I think are being seen are probably in recovery. And I think when athletes have been asked to use ketones, they might just be saying yes, but they're not saying that they use them in, in a race. They're talking about the fact that they use them after a race. And again, if you ever catch a, um, a picture where there's a ketone supplement present in a professional cyclist, it's all most always off the bike. Um, so I, I would okay. you know, read into that. Uh, you will, uh, yeah, yeah. So, so, so what is the use case, or I guess what would be what would be the potential mechanism of how a ketone, an exogenous ketone, could help with recovery? Well, that's the thing. I mean, ketones, um, you know, despite all, everything that I've said there in relation to them not really having performance effect, uh, there's no denying the fact that they have very dramatic metabolic effects. So 
even even in the studies where we see you know, no effect on performance, we see large effects on, on things like well, obviously ketone body concentrations, but you'll see changes in glucose concentrations. You'll often see changes in, in lactate concentrations. Um, again, you'll see lower um, free fatty acid concentrations, which effectively means that they're kind of suppressing the, the breakdown of, of fat in the adipose tissue and fat tissue. So there, there's no doubt that they have dramatic effects because if you remember when I talked about the ketone body um, concentrations rising during starvation, they're rising because the body uses them as an alternative fuel. You know, in a scenario where there's limited food availability and low glucose availability. Um, the body needs something else for the brain. Ketones come in and have that effect. And they also then have protein sparing effects and all of those other um, well-established um, uh, biochemical effects in, in the body. So I don't think anyone's disputing the fact that the ketone bodies can have dramatic effects on multiple organs. It's just a question about the use case. And you know we're saying at the moment that it's limited enough on the performance side. But when you factor in the things like, um, like a protein sparing effect, um, or, for example, uh, an impact on sleep because of the way that it can be used as a substrate on the brain. Um, they are two of the most uh, dramatic effects, I think, that are being associated with recovery. This idea that um, in like an overtraining scenario is where there's one study they were, they, where they showed some nice benefit. There's a couple of others around um, recovery use, using sleep as, a, as an outcome measure. So something within that domain is, is where the recovery effects have been seen. And... Um, there's a potentially some effect on, on the recovery of muscle glycogen. Again, mixed kind of data on, on that as well. But if we take, the, say, the totality of the performance data and the totality of the recovery data, there's many more positive studies in the recovery side of things than there is on, on the performance side at this moment in time. So again, I think that the field is gradually shifting towards that. Like we, we've written a lot of papers about performance, but if someone was to say to me now, where would you, you know, do your next study? Uh, it would be definitely in the, in the recovery domain. Okay, brilliant. I think uh, it, it, it's it's good to it's good to highlight that. With um, if we could yeah. double click on the protein sparing effect for a second, yeah. and then maybe the the, the, sl the sleep. So, um, for someone who I guess maybe could hazard a guess as to okay, so does that mean it, it is um, this saving the protein and you having your yeah. is it preserving your muscles from breakdown? Like how how does that how does how does that work? Yeah, so there's, there's two processes. Again, this is a very sort of um, very general sort of overview of the processes but um, when we talk about um, recovery from exercise we're kind of talking about this idea that when you exercise there's a breakdown catabolic we call the processes taking place um, and in the recovery period we talk about anabolic processes so building things back up again and so oftentimes if we forget about um, um, sort of ketones for a second if we're talking about say protein supplements um, it's often talked about that you know protein a supplement can potentially be anti-catabolic you know it can stop breakdown and if you provide protein after exercise, you're supplying those nutrients for that anabolic response. So that's I, like people, I think, intuitively understand that idea that, you know, you're kind of slowing breakdown and you're amplifying the recovery and the growth processes. So actually, that's what we're often doing with protein supplements and ketones through a different mechanism, but through um, uh, so different mechanism, different pathway, but similar concept. The idea is that in, you know, in, in states where there's catabolic processes take place, ketone bodies seem to have an effect to to slow those processes. Again, this is this is data going back 40 years that, that has shown this. Um, and then there's, again, in the 80s, there was a couple of papers that showed that ketones could drive the anabolic processes. So again, this remains to be, you know, very clearly demonstrated, let's say, in an athletic population or in, in recovery studies, but there's little bits and pieces here and there where we can see that ketone bodies can, can dampen that catabolic effect and certainly there's a couple of papers now that show that ketones have this anabolic effect in the, in the post-exercise period. So that's really the, the idea is that if you um, can repeatedly, you know, let's say, um, maximize recovery uh, after exercise, that's where we get adaptive responses um, to exercise. And one of, one of the more, uh, again, interesting uh, pieces of research that was done in a couple of recovery studies is looking at this idea of um, the effect on EPO. So EPO, as, as, as you may know, is, is, a, is a peptide in the, in the body that drives um, adaptations. Well, we think about altitude training and, and driving the, um, the synthesis of red blood cells. Um, that's one of the uh, mechanisms is through this, uh, this EPO molecule. It's a drug that has been subject of a lot of interest and a lot of positive cases for, for pro cyclists who are trying to uh, improve endurance performance. But it turns out that in, in at least a couple of studies that um, it's been shown that EPO is, is uh, the the secretion of EPO 
is elevated after exercise when ketone supplements have been ingested. So it's this idea that, okay, there's, you know, we're talking about muscle and we're talking about um, muscle protein synthesis, but potentially there's other mechanisms around, for example, EPO. Now, again, all of this mm. is, um, to be said, must be said, these are all kind of acute studies where we're looking at molecular mechanisms, how this translates into real world applications for people who are training for weeks and months, athletes and so on and so forth. That, that remains to be seen. But there's a lot of preliminary information or, you know, results, I would say, there that, that do show some, show some promise. I guess that's the what gets everyone really excited of, of like, oh, well, yeah. that mechanism has been proven out. So surely it must, you know, higher EPO means higher endurance. And I'm going to be like, the I, who needs to who needs to dope, right? Um, but yeah, very it's a very it's very different when you achieve um, bring it back down to a use case and it doesn't quite work like that. Yeah. Um, it's funny with the uh, with various different drugs and compounds that what they're developed for. And they test yeah. the mechanism for the target market often doesn't end up being the case. And just when you were talking about yeah. the uh, um, the protein or the muscle sparing effect, the protein sparing effect exogenous ketones can have, um, you know, an athlete, there's a good use case. But I guess um, I know you've done some work around this with healthy aging um, and preserving yeah. muscle mass. Um, maybe they've got a better use case there. What are your thoughts on the role of exogenous ketones with aging with an aging population? Yeah, I think a lot depends. Um, you know, I, I think in practical terms, so let's just, you know, the studies haven't been done, but let's just say they happen to be done and they show there was a benefit of, of a ketone versus, a, you know, placebo condition. I would start to then ask the question, well, what is the cost of that relative to other interventions? And, you know, at the moment, you know, if we think that there's decent evidence around higher protein diets in, in older adults, um, and that's a relatively cheap intervention, then that's where you start a question well okay if there's limited evidence uh, for ketones if it's a, if it's a maybe and it's a very and it's an expensive product you know at what point do you say hold on this this isn't really suitable you know we either need a stronger evidence base or we need a cheaper product you know something like that um i'm as you know from an exercise uh, science background so even though i've done you know work with things like omega-3 supplements and protein supplements and leucine rich supplements and so on um in the context of healthy aging exercise is still you know, by far and away, the most important factor here. So if we're talking about um, uh, trying to mitigate muscle loss, um, you know, during bed rest, for example, you know, we try to get some kind of movement into the into the muscles. And uh, that, that could even be neuromuscular electrical stimulation like that. You know, it's, it's that's how important it is to have contraction of, of the muscle. And so similarly, again, like I, I sort of, um, you know, the, my, my sort of unhelpful practical answer when someone asks about a supplement is, uh, well, have you tried you know, exercise first. And I'm not being, I mean, there's lots of people who, who can't exercise for lots of different reasons. So I'm not trying to be too clever there. But the point is that there are, um, when, when we're getting down into very niche supplements from a healthy aging point of view, they, they may be small factors compared to some of the bigger things we can, you know, bigger levers we can pull like, like exercise. So um, I'm not trying to dodge your question. More or less, the, the, in some ways, the evidence isn't there, but there are probably bigger uh, pieces to the puzzle that people can work on before they have to you know, think about these uh, these very narrow supplements. Yeah. Okay. So sort of majoring in in, in a minor, right? They, they, they could be. Yeah. Yeah. That old, yeah. So okay. So there could be better use cases. So um, we covered the sort of endurance piece. We covered the recovery piece, and recovery seems to be more strong than endurance. Where are we at with um, uh, brain health and cognitive function um, with regards to exogenous ketone? Yeah, so again, here I would um, highlight that uh, it, it's really important, you know, what we're talking about from the point of view of outcome measures and, and in what population. So if we take, um, in, in our studies, we've done a couple of studies just at rest. Okay, So individuals, they take a ketone supplement, you measure outcomes around cognitive performance. So, you know, we have a batter, battery of tests that we can do usually on, on tablets. Um, but we've done those types of studies where it's just at rest um, in a normal individual uh, we don't see any impact of, of these ketone supplements and those measures. Now, again, anecdotally, you'll hear people who will say, you know, I may take a um, ketone supplement and, and I feel like I can work, you know, more intensely or for longer and so on. Like, to be fair, we don't measure that in studies. We, you know, we measure these performance tests. And that's always, that's always a, a, an important point when it comes to uh, scientific studies is, you know, and I'm a person who's very conservative in terms of what I say about the outcome measure that we measure. Um, so we, look, in those types of tests, we've generally not seen anything at rest. 
uh, as I mentioned kind of earlier in in athletes where we've done studies where um, effectively cognitive function has declined over time because of the you know the length of duration of the exercise or fatigue is, is coming on um, we have seen some effects there and, and in this case what I would say again is that we're not enhancing cognitive performance we're actually just minimizing the decline that would occur otherwise during fatiguing um, exercise and another group um, in the ultra endurance space showed that as well so again that's an example of where uh, the, the devil's in the detail you know mitigating a decline is the way i would describe it as, to, as opposed to enhanced performance now the, the reason I, i'm again specific about the wording there is because when we then think about say the other use case which a lot of people get into is in older adults and they're there oftentimes you are here now talking about period of cognitive decline you know many older adults will have will exhibit um a cognitive decline over time and again in terms of the research that we've done that idea of mitigating decline um you know that's i think where something might be useful from from the ketone side of things and where again um and stephen canaan's work in, in canada for example has shown that over six months of supplementation with, with mct oil that are mct like product that you can see benefits in, in cardio function in older adults. So again, um, I'm not saying that these aren't useful in younger individuals, but I think, the, again, it's the scenario that they're useful, you know, uh, mm. challenging, um, you know, work, for example, um, uh, uh, exercise interventions that lead to cognitive, you know, performance decrements because of fatigue. Older, you know, there, there are uh, examples where you get into the specifics, so that's where you might see some benefits. But it's, to echo what you said earlier, it's not a blanket, it works for everyone in all situations, but there are definitely, uh, I think, some positive trends in, in some of that research that's out there. So um, a question I like to ask different people is uh, what they would go long and short. And I'm not talking about financial um, markets or anything like that. I'm talking about um, what would you go long or bet on the efficacy increasing with time? But I'm not talking about... Um, ketones you can take this as everything you can take creatine to fish oil to you know alligator pepper whatever you want what would you, maybe <laughs> maybe a couple you'd go long and a couple you'd go short i overhyped i think you know, the research isn't there but yet you know every idiot podcaster like me is uh you know touting and all this kind of stuff yeah like the, on, on the go shores uh um I mean, how many? How many do I want to name? You know, the funny thing is, as many as you want. There, I'm sort of being, I'm being funny there, but like, uh, I think there's an awful lot of stuff, um, a lot of products on the market that, um, that you know, there's there's a hype behind, um, and it ranges from everything to from dietary supplements to, um, you know, recovery products and all sorts. And I suppose on one, so I'm gonna. This is more of a personal uh, anecdote now. So, um, as a scientist. I look at these papers and I'm thinking, hold on, like, you know, there's a bad design here, there's it interpreted badly, the stats aren't right, you know, and there's all these things that like, no, there's just nothing here. But like it'll be still publicized and there'll be a product and there'll be a claim on the website and so on. So as a scientist, you know, I'm very skeptical. Then if I'm you know, I, I background I, I've played sport at a decent level in Gaelic games, which is a, a sport in Ireland here. And um while I was a while I was a player, um I would have tried pretty much anything going to try kind of performance edge. Within reason, and something that you know definitely wouldn't harm me, and uh, certainly wouldn't harm my pocket. That was the other thing. Like a lot of the stuff is, is can be an expensive uh, waste of money in terms of uh, some of these hobby aids and so on. Um, but it, you know that that was the, the scientist attitude was very much like, no, let's be conservative and let's interpret the research and so on. The athlete attitude, and I think this kind of fits into into the overall public view, is like, well, I want to try something here, and you know, uh, I've heard a bit of hype, and I'll give it a try. But I have to say, the vast majority of things that I tried didn't work. So <laughs> that brought me back to the scientific mindset, which was like, yeah, this stuff, you know, might work for some people, but but not for me. Uh, but then I I also work as a, as a practitioner as well, and so now I deal with, um, you know, work with athletes who are looking to try certain things to get the edge. And you know, going back to the question I mentioned about expense, you know, very simple thing that an awful lot of athletes don't do is eat enough protein at breakfast. Like that, that's a very simple change to make that doesn't require a supplement. Uh, it's a very effective food-based strategy that addresses, you know, something you can usually identify um, just by, by a simple food diary. Um, How many another grams thing is sleep, you suggest right? Yeah, so typically we're suggesting 20 grams or more. So you get, you get a lot of people who might eat, you know, a bit of toast and some jam, uh, you know, so bread and jam, and, uh, or they, they might 
have something like, uh, you know, a croissant for breakfast and it's lunchtime before they have anything substantial uh, from, from a protein intake point of view. But if they have trained the night before or if they have trained that morning, they're effectively in the recovery period. And we're talking about, you know, earlier about the anabolic response and augmenting that response. If they are consuming adequate amounts of protein, they're, you know, they're missing an, an opportunity there. Um, so that, again, that, so that's an example of where, um, uh, you know, a very simple and cheap uh, intervention can, can have an effect. And sleep is the other obvious one. I mean, sleep is one where a lot of people will they'll have their sleep monitors and they'll be talking about blue light blocking glasses and yada, yada, yada. But oftentimes they're on their phone right before bedtime. They're checking their phone in the middle of the night. You know, all these other bad habits that, that people have that, you know, if, if we were to believe, as, as, uh, as a lot of people do, how important sleep is for things like recovery and performance, and yet an awful lot of people don't have good sleep and sleep hygiene, then it, it, you're kind of like, what are all these supplements are kind of a waste of money if you can't even get the basics right. So I realize I've given a sort of a long-winded answer to, you know, what doesn't work. But th- in some respects, what I'm saying is that the, the things that don't work, you know, there's so many other things that could be fixed that it, it's not worth that chasing. Um, Definitely. Well, I, don't, I don't want to dodge your question about what will work in the long run. So. No, no, no. It's um, good. I mean, I, I guess I'd add to my question, um, and uh, and I probably should have said this before, could, could be protocols as well. So, for example, if you're, you know, you're, you're long, yeah. like, just get more protein at breakfast. Um, it reminds yeah. me of the midwit meme. I love the midwit meme of, like, what the sort of maybe slightly unsophisticated person will do is the same as the expert, but then this massive herd of people in the middle just lost in this maze of complexity. Um I think that is a good good message. So um, I'll open it up to sort of protocols as well. So long protein at breakfast, long like just the basics of sleep hygiene, um, which people overcomplicate. I think um, if I've heard you correct. Yeah, I suppose um, you know the the stuff that's boring, unfortunately. So it's like you know, I, I it, in some ways at a basic level, people have to meet the exercise guidelines. You know. Um, Again, you can have all of these kind of sophisticated approaches to training and high intensity and uh, what's our name and different uh, branded versions of exercise. But again, there's a, there's, a, there's a small proportion of the population who do all that stuff. But th- th- this is, a, again, a, it's a bigger probably conversation. But, you know, there's a huge percentage of the population who don't meet the exercise guidelines. Um, so, you know, basically we're talking about 150 minutes of moderate intensity exercise plus two, only two strength promoting exercise sessions a week. Um, and again, I, this data is a bit old at this stage. It was published in, in 2018, but it was a huge, it was 80,000 um, adults in, in the UK. And it was only 10% in total were getting those two strength promoting exercise sessions a week. So one, one in 10 individuals doing enough strength training for, for health, you know, and, and we're talking about stra- strategies to mitigate muscle loss and, and, you know, maintain function and we're looking at supplements and so on. But if you believe the, you know, the literature on, on the benefits of exercise and then only one in 10 people are getting that, like we're studying a very small percentage of the population who are, uh, you know, who are right to benefit, I would think, from some of these, some, from these strategies. So, again, that's this idea of um, if you're not getting the major pieces of, of the puzzle right, um, you know, some of this other stuff is probably not going to have much of an impact. Definitely, definitely. And do you think there's any supplements out there, um, maybe even an exogenous ketone that is, you think is really overhyped? And maybe is there one that you think, as you mentioned, the salt had some promise in the new sort of form? Yeah, um, overhyped. Uh, is everything not hyped, I suppose? Yeah. <laughs> um, I, 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 I'll, um, I'll dodge this question um, by saying that um, I'm not on social media. So, <laughs> so it has to be seriously hyped before it comes across my desk. Uh, it's usually, um, uh, again... Uh, the athletes I deal with it when whenever there's a podcast, uh, you know, a very popular podcast that has some talk of a novel supplement. That's when my phone lights up with uh, questions about this this new supplement or this new peptide or whatever. So it's uh, it comes in cycles. But um, yeah, like, like I said, there's there's um, there's another piece to the to the to the answer there is that it is true that um, there are things that work that we don't you know that we haven't studied in the scientific literature, and you can be um, overly I think skeptical, overly conservative by not you know, being open-minded to the fact that there's some stuff out there that, that could be beneficial. So I would never dismiss um, uh, anyone's personal experience if, they, if they've had a benefit. Uh, and again, there's, there's lots and lots of that. The, the example I often give around the ketone world is that you have a, a lot of athletes will uh, report that their heart rate is lower um, when they consume ketones. And they do like, you know, there's a ride that they do or a run that they do, that they do a lot and they've got their, their, their monitor and so on. 
and they'll do they'll do that exact run or that exact cycle with ketones and their heart rate will be lower and you know that'll be put to me sometimes as you know well it, it, it works and the reality is that that has never been observed in a scientific paper there's never been a lower heart rate but i've heard it enough times to think there's some there's, there's something going on in the real world that we're not picking up in papers now again it could be relaxed it could be they run slower you know there are slightly you know, there could be lots of factors that play into it but you can't dismiss it out of hand if once you hear it a few times so it's um it's challenging from from that point. But of view. It, it's nice anyway, you can. I've got your question it. enough. <laughs> no, no, it's good. It's good. Do, do, you, you didn't dodge. It's good. The um, you know, you got that sort of experience as an athlete. I can sort of relate to it. Where I, I used to play um reasonable standard rugby. Actually, used to, I played in Ireland yeah. a couple of times, which is which was good fun. At oh, well, yeah. We went to Limerick on a tour once, which was great. Um, as I said, the, the nights out were probably the most fun. <laughs> oh yeah, it was it was great people and just super fun. Yeah. Um, yeah, Limerick's yeah. a good place. The uh, uh, so yeah, similar. I would try everything and anything within reason, right? Mm. So you know, it was like fifteen, yeah. sixteen, taking cordyceps and creatine, yeah. and you know, yeah. nothing, yeah. N- nothing beyond that. But just you wonder how much of the the sort of performance side of things is actually a placebo. Um, and then the questions you're speaking with friends, they're like talking about the sort of the next, you know, as you said, uh, supplement touted on some big podcast and. Yeah, it's like, well, are you taking the most studied supplement with regards to athletic performance and more ever? And they're like, well, what do you mean crazy? He's like, yeah, you're taking it. Yeah, no. It's like, yeah. well, that has yeah. way more efficacy than some fringe thing you haven't heard of. But there's this romanticism about the sort of new sexy thing. Um, but uh, yeah, sure. No, I think I think that's that's a very well put and a good example. I, I don't have um, I don't have a huge amount to add to that. I, I agree. I mean the. The placebo point that you mentioned there that maybe worth coming back to, I think there there's a, a large amount of, of um placebo effect. And again, this has been well documented in the literature. It's not like it's not like we just go, Oh, there's a placebo effect. I mean, these there are studies that have explicitly told people that, you know, it's product A B C and it's just been the same. Every A B C has been the identical and still people will have different effects. So there's a lot of stuff around caffeine, for example, in, in that scenario. And the reason that's so funny is that you know, someone should know whether they've had caffeine or not. They should they should be able to feel it. And yet, in these in these studies that have looked at, say, placebo, they they have effectively told the, the people you're you're getting a, a dose of caffeine here, um, and that's enough again to to have a positive effect, even though it's an inert substance. So there there is a you know there's a large body of work on the placebo effect in, in performance. I'd imagine you know there's something similar out there in, in the context of of, of um, health outcomes as well. So it's not to be dismissed, but Again, uh, you know, the scientist to me would say, you know, very much take account of the placebo effect. The practitioner to me would be, well, let's a, let's take advantage of the placebo effect because, you know, if you've got this, if you're working with an athlete and they have an expectancy around a product or an expectancy around a strategy, it ultimately benefits them, you know, great for them, you know. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, but I suppose the um, where the cynicism I think comes in is where you've got companies who are sort of trading on that, uh, you know, that kind of outlook and, uh, you know, you know, we're always uh, we don't like people to waste their money in some ways. No, no, not at all. And there's, there's there's a lot of lot of wasted money out there in this in this space. I think with the placebo effect, yeah. it's uh, we had a a placebo researcher on, and um, she was brilliant. Yeah. And uh, yeah. we spoke about how if you know it's a placebo, but yet still take it, and you know fully well <laughs> well it's a placebo, but it's still <laughs> work. So I I got yeah. just some random vitamin, that is B vitamin, and I just wrote neuroplasticity on it. And every sort of before any bout of learning, I was just take one. I was like, you know what? I don't care. I just I, I want to see if this placebo thing works. So I, I did it for a bit. It was kind of funny. Um, yeah, uh, it yeah it, it's an interesting world. What um, with regards to your 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 research and your um, well, and your studies, what, what are you what are you working on at the moment? Yeah, so we're wrapping up a couple of um, of ketone studies. I, I know I mentioned about the uh, the fact that if I could, you know, put my efforts into something to be into recovery, but we've actually, I think, wrapped up probably our last uh, performance study. Um, we have a couple that's going on La- last year. Uh, sorry, it was actually earlier this year we published it. Um, we showed um, that ketones could have an improve an effect on improving running economy um, in in runners. So trained um, middle and long distance runners, and that was an interesting finding because effectively confirmed a hypothesis around this idea that ketones, if they're being used as a fuel, they're more efficient. Um, it's, a, it's a word that's used a lot. Um, that hadn't been observed to, up to that point. Um, in our opinion, it was because a lot of the studies mixed ketones with carbohydrates, compared mm. them to carbohydrates. Ours is one of the first studies that compared ketones alone 
to carbohydrate alone. Um, and so uh, that was an interesting finding. Um, we published it, uh, you know, confident in the results and so on. Um, we tried to replicate that study. Um, so if you're not familiar with the concept of replication, there's a, this idea that, you know, you've lots of observations in, in research uh, that get published. And people never bother to see if they can be replicated because they just accept them as, as fact. Um, our replication was part of another, it was part of a study where same, pretty much the exact same exercise challenge uh, in the study, but we were interested in the fact that, um, you know, um, the third, the new generation of running shoes, these carbon fiber mm. um, plate uh, running shoes, they improve running economy. We had the study that said ketones can improve running economy. Why don't we put them together and see, can they sort of, you know, uh, if there's a synergism behind them, uh, so it turns out, uh, this paper is under review at the moment, um, we couldn't replicate the ketone finding. Um, so the shoes worked, you know, as expected, run economy economies improved by, you know, around about 4%. But the uh, 3 or 4% improvement in running economy we'd seen in the previous study with, with, the, uh, with the ketone ester, um, we didn't see that in this replication study. Um, so, um, you know, the reviewers will make of that what they will. We, we can't really explain it. You know, there's no... Um, <laughs> It's, it's just one of those things. And this is, this again is well documented in, in the literature. There are um, problems with replication when people use, um, you know, the wrong statistics or change the study design or, you know, fool around with the data. We, we did none of that. This was a genuine, you know, pretty much the exact same study and we, we don't see the same effect. So we're kind of at a loss, uh, which uh, again, the reviewers might not like, but it, it is what it is. You know, we don't, we don't see that same benefit in this study as we've seen in the previous one. Um, so that's one piece of work. And then we have another uh, study going on, like I mentioned about the idea of ultra-endurance. Uh, we've just finished up a study where we've had people running on a treadmill for, for three hours um, with or without ketones. And again, we're interested more there in how does um, how do ketones affect long-term exercise in terms of fuel use and so on. Yeah. So we'll see where that goes. We're just in the analysis phase of that study. But um, yeah, that will probably be where we wrap it up with the with the ketone work in terms of performance. And then we're just trying to put some plans and get some grant funding in for, for doing some stuff around recovery. Um, Brilliant. So, okay. again, we can build on what, what's been done in, in the other, other bodies of work. But my area of interest is, uh, as a practitioner, is mostly in team sports. Um, so I'll, I'll be trying, you know, we'll be trying to do some stuff around recovery from uh, running performance, you know, soccer simulation, uh, that, mm. that type of work. That's, that's what we'd like to do. do you, just out of interest, do you know what, if any, what rough, like, percentage of people in these performance studies what yeah. percentage of the participants go into the study in a state of nutritional ketosis? And then essentially, I guess, they're topping yeah. up with exogenous ketone. Yeah, so we actually exclude people on that basis. So we, we ask them to be consuming um, mixed diets rather than low-carb diets. Um, oh, and so that's typically an exclusion criteria because the, the, the answer is we don't actually know what the effect would be in the sense that um, there's only been one study... As, far as I know. Actually, sorry, there might have been a couple, there might be two where they've had people, I think in one study they called them keto naive versus keto adapted. And in another study they put them on a short term uh, ketogenic diet. And in both cases what you see is obviously the baseline level of ketones is 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 high and then it gets a little bump when, when they consume the supplement. Um, but we don't really know whether there's a synergism or um uh, you know, effectively, the body can't use extra ketones because they're already in ketosis. We don't actually know this again. When we talk about it as, as groups, you know, and speculate, there's people who can fall on both sides. But those studies haven't really been done to, to see whether the effect of being, say, on a ketogenic diet and then taking a ketone supplement, is that better or worse than being on, the, say, a mixed diet? So that's, a, again, an, an open-ended question. Because yeah. I, I think what you're getting at is a lot of people who follow Keto diets will also use keto supplements. Um, so yeah. it is an interesting one that that's happening in the real world, but it's not really been studied too much. Um, yeah, in the scientific it's funny world. that. Well, I guess I get I, I can see the sort of the the hypothesis of like okay, let's just get people regardless of their diet, and you know yeah. they've got the exogenous ketone that's the variable we're testing, as opposed to you know someone who is in ketosis all the time. And I just wonder if there's more sort yeah. of adaptations. But um, I guess if I was if I was a researcher, I'd, I'd like to explore that. What would be your uh, your your dream study to run, um, or maybe you know, if you could wave a magic wand and know one thing, what would you do, what would you want to know with regards to ketones and all this? Well, we 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 wrote a paper actually a few years ago um, around the anti catabolic effects of, of ketones, and the context there was around the kind of bed rest, uh, surgical uh, situation, surgical recovery. Um, 
And, and the reason I, I say that is because there are limited enough strategies that work in those scenarios. You know, so you asked me about healthy aging earlier. Um, one of the big challenges in, in the aging domain is when uh, an older adult has a, a period of enforced bed rest. And I think, you know, I think there's mechanistic and molecular uh, reasons why ketones would be very useful uh, in that scenario in terms of mitigating the catabolic state. Um, again, Andrew Kutnick, who, who, uh, who was the, the lead author on that paper, he's done some work in the area of cancer cachexia. Again, this, this is not just to say that uh, ketones are, you know, preventing cancer or anything like it. This is the idea that in a, in a cachexic state, so in a, in a breakdown state, the typical of cancer, that their data in, in rodents at least show that the, the ketone bodies can be anti, again, anti-catabolic. So these scenarios where you, again, I mentioned this earlier about where, where ketones kind of, um, you know, they, they, they're really, they seem to be valuable in situations where the body is really stressed or really strained. Um, that for me would be, you know, a, a lovely study to do would be something around either the, you know, ARA surgical, so pre, during, post-surgery type uh, scenario or in periods of enforced bed rest where ketones might mitigate some of those losses and effectively give the person a better chance of recovery thereafter. I have seen some unpublished work, I'm not going to say by whom, um, or because I, I don't know when it's going to come out, but I saw it presented at a, at a conference that showed some really impressive um, recovery from, from muscle wasting. Uh, so it's a protocol where they do some muscle wasting and look at recovery um, with, with ketones. And I mean, the data were mind-blowing in, in the sense of how positive the response was. So I, I don't know where that literature, it's probably a year since I saw it presented, so I do wonder where that uh, data has got to, but I, I'm sure there's some interesting papers potentially coming out in that domain. So yeah, I think that, yeah. that'll be a really, you know, it's completely divorced from the question about athletic performance, but it is an area where I think there could be some some really nice, um, valuable work there. Well, yeah, an, an important use case as well, right? If it's, um, that's the sort of the, the, the spiral into sort of bad aging, or not bad aging, but sort of uh, yeah. unhealthy aging, right? You can't move, yeah. get any exactly. exercise. It's, I can see the importance of, of that. Um, Right. Some sort of uh, some rapid fire questions to finish it, it, if if you're good with that. Uh, a little bit, a little bit different, maybe uh, diverging a bit off the off the ketone world. Um, okay. Are there any books that have sort of helped shape your worldview, or anything you well sort of any books that have helped shape your worldview? And is there anything interesting you're reading at the moment? Hmm. Shape my worldview. Uh... I don't think so. I, it's not that I uh, am not a, a, a reader of, of sorts, um, but I've tended to generally read scientific books and um, they don't really shape your worldview. They're just, uh, you know, um, more of the same, I suppose, what I do in my daily job. Um, I'm reading at the moment. Um, well, this is, again, a, a sort of a habit I have of having a few books on the go at the moment. So um, I finally got around to trying to read Peter Thiel's Outlive. Um, so I'm going to see how that goes. Um, you know, you know, his podcast, The Drive, I think most of probably what's in the book has already been covered. So we'll see where I get with that. Um, I have Richard Feynman's um, second uh, book. So what is his first one? It's called Sure You're Joking, Mr. Feynman. You know, the physicist from yeah, the I, US. I that so, uh, his sec- yeah, so that, that actually was a really good book. His second one is called, uh, oh, what's it called? So all you're joking. Oh no, that was the first. No, sure you're joking. Is the first one. The second one is something like uh, "Why would you care?" or some something like that. Yeah, um, okay. But anyway, so that that's the one that's on the go at the moment. And there's another book I've on the go at the moment. Uh, anyway, so that there gives you a sign of my sort of haphazard approach to reading. Is I usually have a few on the go and I'm dipping in and out. And uh, uh, when I have a busy family life with three boys, so um, the, you know, I don't have much time in the evenings to read. Yeah, so that, okay, that, that, the there you go. <laughs> you got you got a lot on your plate, right? Um, yeah. Okay. Well, so is there in the last year is there a new I don't know habit protocol something to do with health that you've incorporated that's made a real positive impact? Uh, I won't say I've incorporated because I've actually stopped doing it. But uh, there was um, there's a a girl who did her um, her PhD in, in my group. Uh, Michelle Horn is her name, and um, a former colleague of mine, uh, Sarah Kelly. So uh, two uh, Dr. Sarah Kelly and Dr. Michelle Horn. They launched a, a brand called Horology, uh, which is a, a supplement brand aimed at women specifically. I'm, I'm not sure if it's available outside of Ireland, but uh, they certainly launched within Ireland. And um, they were, you know, my wife was trying out some of the products. And then I decided, well, you know, I know they say that for women, but I'm going to try them out as well. So effectively, it's a, you know, it's a high B vitamin, high magnesium type product. And, you know, there's been a lot of hype around magnesium. And um, I, have a, I have a couple of friends and a couple of skeptics who were like, you know, what's all this hype about and so on. So I'm, well, I'm going to try this. 
you know, better be the guinea pig than, than not. Um, and I got the, I have to say, I started taking it uh, before bedtime and um, I started having the most um, vivid dreams and what felt like deep, well, I want to say it felt like deep sleep, but I used to, I used to wake up in such a trance of like having all these vivid dreams and I'm not really sure whether it was, uh, you know, for better or for worse, but um, so I, I would say that, uh, you know, to answer your question, uh, it was a very dramatic effect of what seemed like a very uh, simple um, um, change, let's say, in habit. Um, I stopped doing it because I, I sort of, yeah, I don't know if I was becoming dependent on it or if it was like too much, too much overload or whatever. But uh, yeah, that was uh, that was the one thing that I probably in the last year have tried out and noticed in fact. Okay, nice, nice. Uh, the last one I'd like to ask um which is uh, a bit different, but I quite uh, I quite like it. Um, you might not. We'll see. Feel free to feel free to dodge it if needed. But um, what important truth do you believe that very few people also believe? But I believe that others own. Oh. Um, that, that's a difficult one because, um, yeah, it's, it's hard to, uh, it's hard to give an answer without giving a lot of background context. Uh, I don't, I don't, I don't have a simple answer here because it's to do with, um, I guess it's to do with, uh, the way that health can be influenced across a uh, generation. So I, I think that, um, I think that we don't probably pay enough attention to the health of mothers um in terms of then the implications on on babies and their and their knock-on effects so we've we've been doing a bit of work over the years with pregnancy and uh and the health complications associated with pregnancy and the knock-on effects then in terms of, of neonatal health and for me i just think that it's such a it's such a massive i would say it's an amplifier you know effectively um, you know, if there's un unhealthy pregnancies, um, can have, as you know, epigenetic effects anyway. But then there's also then the the cycle that comes with, you know, what influenced the poor health of the mother is that now present in the environment of, of the of the toddler and so on. And it's absolutely nothing. You know, it's not a blame game as such. It, it's just the fact that I think we should be putting greater, far greater emphasis um, into. Um, pregnancy and neonatal health than we are putting into older adults, which is the reason I was smirking and kind of hesitation is because as much as the work that I do in, in older adults and we, you know, trying to optimize aging and so on and so forth, it actually begins in the cradle. It begins in the, in the womb, in fact. And I think that um, that is something where uh, it's completely misplaced, or sorry, disproportionate, the amount of effort and money we place into uh, middle age and older life as opposed to into, into early life. And I suppose you know, whether it's the, the mother, um, the childhood, whether it's uh, uh, nutrition in schools, there's so many things that I think need to be addressed early in life that, um, I don't know, I don't know, is, is that a truth that I believe that other people don't believe, but it's maybe just a statement that I think we place, I don't know, our, this podcast, we're talking about middle to older age and everything, but there's so much going on earlier in life that sets, that, you know, sets the scenes for, for people's health in later life that I, I think we just really need to plow more resource in, into that domain. I'm pleased to ask. I think it's a really, really nice answer. Um, you never know what you're going to get with those answers of how people interpret it, but usually it's, a, usually it's, quite, it, it's quite good because people have a strong emphasis on it. Um, honestly, the, the, I've learned so much today, so thank you so much for coming on. Before we wrap it up, where can we, where can we keep up to date with your research? Where can we, where can we find you? Yeah, so like I said, I'm, I'm not on social media, so if uh, people want to get in touch, just do the old-fashioned email. So uh, you can yeah, just find search for my name in Dublin City University, and uh, you'll you'll find my email address. And you know, people are interested in in uh, conversation, just drop me an email. But my research is again easy enough to find. Research case, we put all uh, put all of our research up on there, and uh, Google Scholar, you can find my stuff as well. So all the typical avenues. But um, yeah, if it's a conversation you want, it's uh, old-fashioned email. Very good. Very good. Well, those Brendan Egan, thank you so much for coming on. It was really fun. I really enjoyed talking to you. Thanks, man. Great questions. <laughs>